Well, thank you for coming to this final session on Pope Francis's new encyclical, Fratelli Tutti. And today is chapter seven and eight. And these two, first he starts off with chapter seven. It's all about paths of renewed encounter. So the premise of this whole chapter, I think, is best encapsulated in this sentence I pulled here. There's also a need for peacemakers, he says, men and women prepared to work boldly and creatively to initiate processes of healing and renewed encounter. So there's a lot of discussion of forgiveness, memory, cultural memory, um, war, death penalty, different ways of talking about peace and the importance of truth in this whole process. So it's a very fruitful, fruitful chapter. It's a big one, bigger than chapter eight, but I think there's a lot of good stuff in here. <clears throat> so I wanna start by, at the beginning, he says, only by basing themselves on the historical truth of events will they be able to make a broad and persevering effort to understand one another and to strive for a new synthesis for the good of all. So he begins this whole, starting anew from the truth. Truth is kind of the foundation. Truth is an indispensable companion, he says, of justice and mercy. And all three together are essential to building peace. And each of them prevents the other from being altered. So it's kind of like, in a sense, a trinity of, of ideas or, or poles or things we're working with in order to keep all three of them in balance, truth, justice, and mercy. We usually, we usually hear about justice and mercy, kind of two ends of the pole, and how do you work them? How do you balance them? But he's saying, no, it needs to be a tripod. You need to have three points balancing, truth, justice, and mercy, and all three of them have to work together because they all are essential to building peace. <clears throat> and... <clears throat> Um, he says, we should never confine others to what they may have said or done, but value them for the promise that they embody. This is bold because this is so contrary to how we're living currently in a society where everything everybody has ever said is remembered for all eternity on the internet, <laughs> right? So much of our society right now is like going through and combing through everything anybody has ever done and sometimes even judging them based on our current understanding of how things are. And Pope Francis is saying, no, that's kind of a dead end. We need to value them for the promise that they embody. Like don't cut someone out just because of their horrible past. You have to see the promise, the potential, you have to like look at someone and see the future, not the past. It's a different way of looking at things. Um, and what Pope Francis says here is getting people to work together side by side is the best way to go about this healing and this renewal. And it feels like every single time we have one of these, I'm bringing up Father Gregory Boyle, right? <clears throat> Again, I just remember this story that he told of this, this gangster youngster and this other gangster puppet who were just hated each other. And then they come work at Homeboy Industries, baking bread in the bakery. And I mean, you can look up his, his story. Just you can find this by doing a YouTube search for Father Gregory's Hilton Award speech, acceptance speech, which he just got a few weeks ago. And this story about how youngster and puppet hated each other, opposite gangs, right? And they work together. And then when Puppet gets jumped by another gang and is in the ICU, it's like on life support, his head is swollen to the size of a beach ball. And youngsters just torn up about it, just absolutely torn up. Can I give him my blood? Can I do something? And he eventually says, he was not my enemy. He was my friend. We worked together. Like, that is absolutely what Pope Francis is talking about here. Um, you can't define and confine others to what they may have been, right? You have to value them for the promise that they embody. And by getting people to work together side by side, people can see that potential, see that future, see the value in each other. Um, <clears throat> okay, Pope Francis goes on and he says, there is an architecture of peace to which different institutions of society contribute. 
each according to its own area of expertise. But there is also an art of peace that involves all of us. Now, I think this, this, is, this is really cool. And I'm not sure, Pope Francis doesn't do this explicitly, but I think this lines up with the earlier distinction from last week, where he had that distinction between elicited love and commanded love, right? Elicited love is when charity is just drawn forth from us based on what we see. And commanded love are those social justice structures that we build into our society, right? Well, here he's making another distinction again between an architecture of peace to which different institutions of society contribute. Well, that's like commanded love. Those, that architecture of peace that we build with our laws and striving for social justice is embodying the commanded love from earlier, right? But there's an, also an art of peace that involves all of us. And that's the elicited love that has to come to the surface when we encounter someone on the street, when we encounter someone in need, right? Um, and I, I, I think that's, that's, I don't know, I just really like that. <laughs> And he, again, he doesn't make that explicit connection between those two, but um, it seems like it's there to me. It seems like they line up and it, they just support each other just very, very well. And then he concludes this beginning section by saying, this requires us to place at the center of all political, social, and economic activity, the human person who enjoys the highest dignity and respect for the common good. And he says, we have to begin with the least. Only the closeness that makes us friends can enable us to appreciate deeply the values of the poor today, their legitimate desires and their own manner of living the faith. The option for the poor should lead us to friendship with the poor. <clears throat> if we have to begin anew, it must always be from the least of our brothers and sisters. Now, this, this recalls to mind, again, the, that quote from Aristotle's Ethics in the beginning of his treatment of friendship, where he says, it seems like friends have no need of justice. In a sense, friendship is perfect justice. Um, and that, that seems to me what Pope Francis is referring to here, the option for the poor, right, is social justice should lead us to friendship with the poor. It's not only creating the commanded love, it's not only creating the, the structures of peace, it's also having the art of peace in our souls. It's also having the elicited love flowing forth from us in friendship to those we're working with. Um, yeah, okay. Now the next main, next section of chapter seven is about the value and meaning of forgiveness. Well, I could give a whole talk on forgiveness. <laughs> this is such a huge topic. Um, Pope Francis begins it by talking about how there's inevitable conflict in our lives, right? But Jesus never promoted violence or intolerance, he says. And then he brings up the quote from Matthew, the scripture verse from Matthew chapter 10. And that's, that's the, the verse where um, Jesus says, I have come to set fire set the earth on fire, right? And how I wish it were already blazing. Um, do you think that I've come to establish peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division, right? It's that really hard quote from Jesus in the gospels, Matthew chapter 10, 34 through 36. So Pope Francis begins with that section and he says, okay, you gotta really pay attention to what Jesus is doing there. And what Jesus is speaking of is fidelity to our decision to follow him, right? This faithfulness to Jesus is what he's talking about with that with that really hard gospel gospel passage, um, and then it's it's amazing what what Pope Francis does there. Now I have to dig really deep in here, and I dug into the footnotes. And if you look at the footnote for that section dealing with that quote, Pope Francis's Fratelli Tutti, he's re referencing Pope. John Paul II's two encyclicals, which were referencing Pope Pius XI's encyclical, which is referencing Pope Leo XIII's original encyclical on social justice. Okay, so Pope Francis's reference here goes back many, 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 many layers. And it's, it's really interesting if you dive into this, because 
he goes into a lot of discussion about socialism and what's at the heart of it and what we need to excise from it, the good parts, the bad parts. Um, and going back to that search, this is, this is the quote from Pope Pius IX in Quadragissimo Anno that I really thought was very insightful and applicable to us today. He says, if the class struggle abstains from enmities and mutual hatred, then it gradually changes into an honest discussion of differences founded on a desire for justice. That's so important for us to remember, right? We're going through cataclysmic change with what's going on in the United States right now. Pope Pius XI, which gets references all the way up to Pope Francis now, they're saying, in order for this to bear fruit, we have to make sure it doesn't have hatred and enmity in it. And that's so hard to do because we see so much of that, but our, we, we must strive as Catholics to excise all hatred and all enmity from our heart so that when we have conversations, they can bear fruit. Um, okay, so legitimate conflict and forgiveness he talks about as well. He says, straight up, we are called to love everyone without exception, right? True love for an oppressor means seeking ways to make him cease his oppression, right? So it's it's not just um, this inner feeling of love, and it's it's going on be, beyond just willing the good of another. It's it's actually seeking means and ways to help help him cease his oppression. Okay, um, and the important thing again, Pope Francis says straight up is not to fuel anger. We have to be so careful. Like we got to think about the way we speak about things and we have to think about the way we propagate information. If it's fueling anger, we got to hit the pause button and say, wait a second, we can't do this. We got to back up because if we're going to bear fruit with this conversation, this discussion that's going on, <clears throat> we have to make sure not to have any hatred fueling our discussion. Otherwise, that'll just make things go up in flames rather than <laughs> build a society of peace. <laughs> okay. Legitimate conflict and forgiveness. Now he brings in forgiveness. Persons who nourish goodness in their heart find that such goodness leads to a peaceful conscience and to profound joy, even in the midst of difficulties and understanding. And this brings back Philippians chapter four, right? whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, gracious. If there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things, right? And then the God of peace will be with you. That's exactly what Pope Francis is saying here. Persons who nourish goodness in their heart, right? That leads to a peaceful conscience and to a profound joy. And that, that will get people to rally around us, right? <laughs> the best way to move on, authentic, Reconciliation does not flee from conflict, but is achieved in conflict, resolving it through dialogue and open, honest, and patient negotiation. <clears throat> now, I, I think it's important here to, to <laughs> recognize the honest part. Um, because if, if truth, remember the very beginning here, he laid out truth, mercy, and justice, right? This this three-legged stool that we're striving towards. In order to achieve those three, we need to be honest because both sides being honest lets us refine our subjective perspective around the objective truth, okay? And a principle indispensable to the building of friendship in society is that unity is greater than conflict, right? So, Reconciliation is achieved in conflict, but the unity is greater than conflict. So conflict is not the goal. <laughs> Obviously, nobody wants conflict to be the goal. But conflict, it's through that discussion that we achieve unity, right? Um, it's the result. The peace is, is the result. Okay, now this section on memory. This is also a really deep section because... Mm, he says, reconciliation is a personal act, 
and no one can impose it upon an entire society, however great the need to foster it. And this is a lot of the things we're wrestling with today with, with the racial tension. Like we need to be reconciled with our history as a country and what we've done as a people and a culture, right? But at the same time, reconciliation is a personal act. Hmm. Remember two weeks ago when we had that discussion about person and people? Like <clears throat> person, St. Thomas Aquinas defines as that which is most perfect in all of nature. And I proposed, Pope Francis doesn't say this, is that a people is what is most perfect in all of a culture. Maybe if reconciliation is a personal act, maybe there is a way to have two people reconcile, you know, as cultures. Um, I don't know. That's just a random thought that I just had right now. But it, it's, it's something we're wrestling with right now as a country with all the racial tension. Pope Francis says reconciliation is a personal act. Uh, how do we get those together? Anyway, maybe we can discuss that later. Um, he, but he does say forgetting is never the answer. <laughs> Um, I think not only of the need to remember the atrocities, he says, but also all those who, amid such great inhumanity and corruption, retained their dignity and with gestures chose the part of solidarity, forgiveness, and fraternity. To remember goodness is also a healthy thing. So forgetting is never the answer. A lot of horrible things have happened, right? But we can't just focus on the atrocities he's saying, because no matter how bad the situation is, God always raises up saints. There are always heroes. There are always shining lights, always beacons in the darkness that we have to remember along with the atrocities. Um, and, and that's so true. Like, I don't know how many of you have been to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, DC. I definitely recommend you go if you're in DC, but they did have these stories of these absolutely heroic individuals and what they did. And you need to remember those in the midst of the atrocities. It's, it is important. It is important. Okay. And now he has a section on forgiving a little bit more in detail where he says, forgiving does not mean forgetting, right? Free and heartfelt forgiveness is something noble. It's a reflection of God's own infinite ability to forgive. And he says, if forgiveness is gratuitous, then it can be shown even to someone who resists repentance and is unable to beg pardon. Um, this brings to mind when I was a seminarian in Madison, Wisconsin, there was a professor at University of Wisconsin-Madison, Dr. Robert Enright. He's a psychologist and he spent his life in psychology, researching forgiveness. And he has this book, Forgiveness is a Choice. Um, I have it here too. Um, it's an amazing book, absolutely recommend it to you. <clears throat> but he also has a lot of really interesting things to say about forgiveness. This could, again, be a whole nother talk, so I don't wanna go into the whole thing. But the one thing I do want to share with you is a really important distinction between forgiveness and reconciliation. Because Pope Francis in his encyclical is kind of jumping back and forth between them, and it's not as clear as I would have liked it to have been. But forgiveness is something you can do regardless of what has happened, whether or not the person who offended you is even alive anymore. It's a virtue of reacting with love to some wrong that's been done to you. Okay. Reconciliation is different because that requires both parties, right? Um, it requires both parties to accept the gift of a, get, uh, the offender to accept the gift of forgiveness. And they're very different things. Um, so I just, I just wanna write that out. If you wanna read more about it, read this book by Dr. Enright. And he has a bunch, many more books as well. It's just absolutely wonderful stuff. Um, okay. Last part, Pope Francis says, forgiveness is precisely what enables us to pursue justice without falling into a spiral of revenge or 
the injustice of forgetting. So he's, he's putting forgiveness. He's basically, Pope Francis is saying, okay, here's the key. I can see a lot of people struggling with anger and revenge and hatred right now. And I want to offer you forgiveness as the key to free yourself from that spiral of revenge, from that spiral of injustice, so that freed from that weight, you will have the freedom to pursue those structures of peace, um, the art of peacefulness, right? I think that's that's why he's putting forgiveness here in this, this peace section. Okay, and then the big this is the this is the part that hit all the newspapers and <laughs> uh, the end of chapter seven where he treats war and the death penalty. I saw this quoted many places and in many headlines. Um, first, about war, Pope Francis says we can no longer think of war as a solution because in today's world, with all our technology and with all our weapons development, straight up, its risks will probably always be greater than its supposed benefits. In view of this, it's very difficult nowadays to invoke the rational criteria elaborated in earlier centuries to speak of the possibility of a just war. Never again war, he says. It doesn't get much stronger than that. And, and, but he goes even farther. Now this part, <laughs> this, this, this totally follows the theme of this whole encyclical where he's thinking huge, big picture, right? Let's rework our entire financial system and political system. And um, he says, with the money spent on weapons and other military expenditures, let us instead establish a global fund that can finally put an end to hunger and favor development in the most impoverished countries so that their citizens will not resort to violent or illusory solutions or have to leave their countries in order to seek a more dignified life. So he's saying, never again war, and let's stop spending all this money on weapons to figure out how to actually feed the world. <laughs> it makes so much sense. <laughs> okay. And then the death penalty. Um, regarding the death penalty, he says, today we must state clearly that, now this is it's just straight up his words, today we must state clearly that the death penalty is inadmissible. And the church is firmly committed to calling for its abolition worldwide. Yeah, there you go. All Christians and people of goodwill are today called to work not only for the abolition of the death penalty. And again, he's going beyond what you expected him to say, right? He doesn't stop with just, we're called to abolish death penalty. No, he says this next part, not only the abolition of the death penalty, legal or illegal, in all its forms, but also to work for the improvement of prison conditions out of respect for the human dignity of persons deprived of their freedom. I would link this to life imprisonment. A life sentence is a secret death penalty. So he's saying, that's that's bold, right? He's, he's, he's thinking big here. Like, let's not only abolish death penalty, let's abolish life imprisonment basically is what he's he's saying in this section. Okay, chapter eight. Um, oh, I'm sad Michael didn't show up. But chapter eight, he talks about religions at the service of fraternity in our world. And in this final chapter, says the goal of dialogue is to establish friendship, peace, and harmony, and to share spiritual and moral values and experiences in the spirit of truth and love. Um, and there's two main sections in this final chapter. First, the ultimate foundation, and then religion and violence. Then later, Pope Francis says the root of modern totalitarianism is to be found in the denial of the transcendent dignity of the human person. Um, so he says if we lose that transcendent dignity of the human person, that will give totalitarianism an opportunity to arise. Um, and then he says, we, the believers of the different religions, know that our witness to God benefits our societies. Um, this is in contrast to some of the militant atheism who, uh, atheists who point out things like uh, the Crusades and other things. Um, but Pope Francis says, no, I've, we've had, no, it's, it benefits our societies. Um, and then Christian identity. 
One fundamental human right must not be forgotten in the journey towards fraternity and peace. It is religious freedom for believers of all religions. Um, we cannot forget Christ's desire that they may all be one. He brings in John's prayer from book of John chapter 17. Hearing this call, we recognize with sorrow that the process of globalization still lacks the prophetic and spiritual contribution of unity among Christians. So even us Christians can't get it together. <laughs> it's really sad. That's one of the things that hurt my heart too. Um, a journey of peace is possible between religions, he said, and its point of departure must be God's way of seeing things. Namely, God's love is the same for everyone regardless of religion. And the truth is that violence has no basis in our fundamental religious convictions, but only in their distortion. Um, and each one of us is called to be an artisan of peace by uniting, and not dividing, by extinguishing hatred and not holding on to it, by opening paths of dialogue and not by constructing new walls. Um, and then at the very end, he just has an appeal, right? In the name of justice and mercy, the foundations of prosperity and cornerstone of faith, justice and mercy. Uh, and then he has a prayer to the creator, right? It's a beautiful prayer. May our hearts be open to all the peoples and nations of the earth. And an ecumenical Christian prayer, O God, Trinity of love, from the profound communion of your divine life, pour out upon us a torrent of fraternal love. And it goes on. Both those prayers are much longer. I just pulled one line from both of them so you can get a sense for them. But um, yeah, that's, that is my presentation.